the future of cities in space. With Joe Yobust from National Geographic. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we look at the future of cities in space. We're going to discuss how the urban areas many of us live in today will lead to cities of the future, placed in orbit around the Earth, on the surfaces of the Moon, Mars, and beyond. Uh, later on the show, we're going to be talking with Joe Yokerst. We'll discuss his new book from National Geographic, 100 Cities, 5,000 Ideas, as well as what cities of today could tell us about our cities of the future. Now, currently, roughly 4 billion people, almost exactly half the world's population, live in cities spread around the globe. By the year 2030, 50, that number is likely to increase to roughly 68% of the world population, including 89% of people living in the U.S., uh, living in urban areas. Now, for those making their homes in space, that number will almost certainly be near 100%. Now, cities in space are also going to face the additional challenges of, well, you know, being in space. Uh, whether in orbit around the Earth, on the Moon, on Mars, or floating around in the clouds of Venus, these outposts will, by definition, be physically closed off from their environments. This means that travel to other outposts and habitations, both by humans and robotic missions, will be both challenging and necessary binding these cities together. With the exception of a few hermits out in the woods somewhere, we all depend on others to help us out, and without them, we would quickly die from the first adversity life threw in our direction. Go away. Now, famed anthropologist Margaret Mead is reported to have stated that the earliest signs of civilization in her mind uh, was the discovery of an ancient femur or a thigh bone healed from a break. Now, this was evidence that society and empathy were both pronounced enough at the time for people to work together for the survival of another human being. A closed ecosystem, de completely dependent on the recycling of air, water, and food is extremely challenging to maintain. The Biosphere 2 experiment in Oracle, Arizona, just outside our home base in Tucson, tested a completely sealed off ecosystem, including eight humans. This grand experiment running from 1991 to 93 modeled the first cities in space, and it had a few hiccups as might be expected from such a novel undertaking. That's why you do the experiment. Exactly. Now, over the course of two years, one occupant had to be removed from the station after an accident. And then the soil inside the biosphere turned out to be too rich with organic material, allowing bacteria within the soil to consume more oxygen than expected, requiring the team outside to pump additional O2 into the habitat for, you know, the human occupants to enjoy. Now, although often portrayed as a failure, Biosphere 2 was the greatest experiment ever conducted in ecological self-organization. Lessons learned from this magnificent venture revolutionized the field of experimental ecology, proving that a sealed ecosystem can work for years. This research led to advances in keeping coral reefs alive, and protecting rainforests, thereby benefiting Earth, while also guiding our visions for the first cities beyond our planetary birthplace. Next up, we welcome Jill Yogurst from National Geographic to the show, talking about the cities of today, as well as the future cities in space. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. 
Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Joe Yogurst. He is the author of a new book from National Geographic called 100 Cities, 5,000 Ideas. That's that's a, that's 50 ideas per city for those of you doing the math. <laughs> and the book is now, as of... Uh, the book has reached the number one new release uh, in general traffic reference on Amazon. So mm -hmm. welcome to the show, Joe. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah. Uh, so just give us an idea. First of all, what what inspired this book? What, what drove you to write it? Well, um, I, it's the fifth book in a series that I've written for National Geographic um, that started in 2017. And we're always looking for new ideas. We did kind of a general 50 states book and then and then national parks and then road trips. Um, and then we did camping after that. So this is the fifth one, but it was actually supposed to be uh, released a long time ago. And then this little thing called COVID came along. I Maybe you've heard about it. Um, yeah, I, think, I, th th I think I've heard the word. And people suddenly stopped traveling internationally. So it didn't make sense to put out a, a global cities book um, when no one was able to go to most of these global cities. In fact, some of them like Hong Kong are still locked down. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they had me do a couple of other things. And then they said, uh, we think people are going to start traveling again in 2022. So let's finish the city's book and get it out. Um, but it was, it's always a collaborative effort. Um, we kick, I kick around ideas with the ed editors at National Geographic in Washington, D.C., and we try to figure out what's, what we should do next, and cities just seem like an obvious one. Yeah, so what, what did you enjoy most about putting this together? Well, visiting the cities, of course, but um, especially the ones I hadn't been to before. Um, but I also kind of like the research. I like the fact that when I'm doing these books, that I wake up every day and I sit down at my desk and I know that it's going to be com something completely new. I'm going to learn something every day that I didn't know the day before. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I like going down research rabbit holes, um, even to the point where they have nothing to do with what I have to write and it's a waste of time. <laughs> um, but I love doing it. And that's what these books allow me to do. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I got to love a good research rabbit hole, right? <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so, you know, I think uh, most people who have I've done my fair share of traveling, and I think most people who have traveled have their favorite cities. And what we like about cities may be subjective, but what to you makes for a great city? Well, it's a lot of different things. Um, some of them, it's the modern, the modern aspect of it. Some of them, it's the old aspect of it it uh, really varies a lot. And sometimes it's mixed and unexpectedly mixed. Um, one of the last cities I visited for this book was Istanbul. And the mm. first time I was there many moons ago as a backpacker in my college days, it was very much a an old fashioned Middle Eastern city and it had that feel to it. Um, and when I went back earlier this year, um, it was very different than what I remembered. Um, it had become much more of a European city and it mm. still had the historic core down by the Bosporus, but it's surrounded by two giant high-rise suburbs. Um, so you have these, so you have the the mosques and the minarets and the Bosporus against a backdrop of these gleaming skyscrapers that are up on the hillsides uh, overlooking the old town. Um, so it's it was interesting because it's such a mix. Um, but you go to a place like Singapore, where I lived for five years, or Dubai that I visited a couple of times. Hmm. And and even Las Vegas, and you're kind of blown away by the modernness of it. Um, 
but I like old cities to bum around too, you know, cobblestone streets and old churches and museums and castles and things. So I'm kind of a generalist when it comes to cities. I, I can take them in any shape or size. Um, hmm. And of course, as we move out into space, we're going to start building first, they're going to be small colonies, and then they're going to grow in sure. size. And eventually, we're going to have cities in space on other planets on the moon. So mm -hmm. what can we learn from our lessons of cities here on Earth, both good and bad, that we could bring, that we should keep in mind when we're designing and building these cities Another well, one. hopefully they, uh, when I think about cities in space or cities in the future, it's funny, I don't necessarily go to the Dubai's and Singapore's of the world. Mm -hmm. I actually go to cold weather cities that have bridges and tunnels that connect large portions of these cities that you don't have to go outside, largely because it's January, not because of the atmosphere that you can't breathe. So I was recently in Calgary and they have an, an amazing sort of system of bridges that, that connect all of downtown. Montreal, where I was a couple of years ago, is the same with the underground city. And I think of those as being more kind of an example or possibly a, a template for cities on, on different planets because they are very much concerned with the outside atmosphere and how that affects the people inside of the structures whether they're living or working in those structures. So I think of those cold weather cities as more of a template than I do the, the hot weather places like Dubai and Singapore. Hmm, that's really interesting. That's really interesting. So um, now as we develop our cities, as cities grow, as we grow as a society, we're starting to build smart cities in some places mm -hmm. where let's say the traffic lights are all coordinated to yeah. make traffic flow as easily as possible. Uh, some mm -hmm. cities are recycling everything, like just garbage. And, <clears throat> so, and so my question is, um, how do all these changes, um, bringing, connecting cities so much, um, how does that change what we know and understand as a city? Well, I think that it takes a lot more forethought and planning rather than sort of just sort of random development, which has been this pattern of so many cities in the past. Um, you know, not planned cities, which there are lots of examples of Washington, D.C., Canberra, Brasilia, the new capitals in Tanzania and Nigeria, places like that. Um, you know, cities kind of developed organically in a in a not necessarily efficient way. Right. Exactly. And I think that when we're building things in the future, you have to consider space, space as in, as in you know, the ground, um, the, the footprint of the city a lot more carefully and use that a lot wiser. Um, I think that we'll building, we'll, we will be building up a lot more than we're building out. Although where I live in California, I wonder when that's ever going to happen. Um, possibly you do in Arizona too. Um, with um, so much space to expand. And I see that overseas too. It's not just in the United States. Again, having recently been in Calgary, I was surprised that, you know, they're in the Canadian prairies and they have endless room to expand, but they're building up in the downtown area and they're still building out on the prairies to the point where some of the new suburbs are an hour outside of the city, surrounded by nothing but grassland, but they're still a suburb. And I keep wondering, well, I was asking people, well, why are they doing that? Well, land is cheap, but in the future, land is not going to be cheap anywhere. And mm -hmm. we really do have to think about building up rather than out much more. Hmm. Hmm. It's so interesting. So, um, and as we expand cities, as cities grow, I mean, Tucson's a perfect example. 1968, we had 5,000 people. Now we have 700,000 or so. Yeah. And um, but as our cities grow, um, we also need to keep in mind the rest of the planet, the earth, the local environment. So how do we build cities that are more eco friendly? Well, I think that there's some examples around the world. Um, I'm a big advocate of using roof space um, mm -hmm. of greening roofs. 
Um, a lot of them go unused and they're just these, these reflective heat, you know, heat attracting surfaces that are not good for the planet. And I think that, um, you know, to, to plant, even if you just plant a lawn on a roof or, but if you can plant, if you can make, you know, market gardens out of it, city gardens for, for food or, or botanical gardens and anything like that to, to increase the green space in cities, I think that'll help the, the planet a lot. Um, and in that same vein, I think that, uh, you know, I, growing up in the, you know, the, the Western United States in a city that has 300 plus days of sunshine every year, I wonder why starting in the 1970s, we didn't have rules that all new buildings, homes and office and factories didn't have solar panels. Mm -hmm. Um, if we had started back in the seventies and, and, you know, California now has a law that I think starts in 2035, that all new structures, all new homes have to have solar panels, but they could have been doing this for the last 40 years. And I, it's, it's just wasted, wasted time. Mm. Um, and the price would be very competitive now if it had been around for 40 years, like a, like a VCR um, mm -hmm. or a CD player, when those prices went down. Um, and, and this will come in the future. It's coming slowly, but I'm impatient to see it happen because I want to see it happen in my lifetime. Right, right. And of course, Jimmy Carter famously, you know, put solar panels on the White House. Yes, yeah, when, exactly. When he was president, and that didn't last long past his term. <laughs> <laughs> well, who came next? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, you really have to really have to think of how much the technology because the technology of solar power and solar cells has just gotten so good now we just recently uh, my wife and i recently um completely solar fired our house so that you know we're producing more more electricity than we use yeah and, and i did it to my house um in 2019 the uh, right before covid um so we haven't paid an electricity bill since then. Yeah, um, yeah it's such a such a great feeling. <laughs> but uh, so, what are what are some of the challenges you found that different cities around the world are facing? Well, if one of the most obvious ones because of climate change is the fact that sea level is rising, right. and cities uh, tend to be heavy things. Um, they have large buildings that weigh a lot and they tend to sink. Um, and I think we're only at the very beginning edge of that happening. You, th you see cities like Venice, which were, Venice was built in an impossible place anyways. Right, it was right. built on a swamp, right? And we saw it in New Orleans with Katrina. Um, you know, so, and it's going to cost billions and trillions of dollars in the future to keep these cities from flooding. Um, the Dutch are way ahead of the curve on that. Um, if you had mentioned the Dutch, I would have. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Uh, and and we're going to have to, again, Amsterdam and Rotterdam and other places were built in places where there probably should have never been a large city. Um, right, they were right. wetlands. And, um, and they were smart about building it. You know, they built it on wooden piles and they built dikes and things like that. And they learned way ahead of the rest of us how to keep the water out. But there are so many cities that are in danger of that happening. New Orleans is an example in the US where there really should have never been a city and the French kind of knew that when they founded the city and the, the American Indians in, in the place told them that. And uh, you know the Mississippi River floods an average of every three years, as long as people have been keeping records. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know there's a reason that the Cajuns lived out in stilt houses and the swamps because they knew it was gonna flood. Right. Quite often, but it's not the only city. Houston is another one. It's a very big city. It's a very heavy city. It's sinking. It's built on wetlands. It's going to. It's flooded every time there's a major storm. It floods. It's going to keep happening. Um, and you know, all coastal cities really have to worry about things like that. From London, which is really a coastal city, even though it's on a river. Um, Miami is another one. Um, I live close to the coast, but I'm at 170 feet above sea level. I actually wanted to find out how far above sea level I was, um, both for tsunamis and for future uh, sea level rise. So I'm 
I may have the beach in my backyard at some point in the future, but uh I'll think of what um, I will do for your property values. <laughs> <laughs> Beachfront exactly, property. Exactly. Yeah. So what you what do you So I think that that's people? that's a big one. Um, you know, crowding is another one. There's just you know, I uh, I have a very funny educational background. I went to a very progressive Catholic high school, and we had a nun who taught ecology back in the 1970s, and a nun who actually advocated for population control, which a lot of nuns wouldn't be allowed to advocate for nowadays. Uh, I think we've gone backwards in that in that respect. And uh, and the population of the planet was about half of what it is now. And if we had somehow stuck to that population, we'd be a lot in, in a lot better shape to face the challenges of the future, which is where's our where where are cities going to get water, drinking water, and other things? Where are the people going to get food? Where are they going to get their energy from? Um, how are they going to keep? How are they going to deal with climate change? Um, these are things that you know are now only really coming into sharp focus, and some countries are ahead of the others, and some cities are ahead of the others. But we're all part of the same planet and we're all affected by other people's, you know, uh, how they how they deal with these things. You know, climate change, food, water. These are global challenges. Every city has to face those. Absolutely. And finally, what's next for you? What's what's next on coming down the pike? <laughs> Lots of eating. Um, I'm, a <laughs> I'm about halfway through a food book for National Geographic on the uh, the food culture and food experiences of the U.S. and Canada, um, which is why I was in Calgary, finding out finding out about the food scene up there. Um, I'm about halfway through writing it. I still have some trips to do. Um, I was never a food writer before, but I sort of had to learn how to do it. Um, I also had to learn how to pace myself through having more than three meals in a day. Um, I, I really feel for food writers now and uh, I, I don't know how they all don't weigh 500 pounds. <laughs> so, right, right, right. Um, so yeah, food is what I'm very much into right now. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Joe. It was fabulous talking with you. Uh, thanks for having me. It was a great conversation. Yeah, and that was Joe Yogurst, author of the new book, 100 Cities, 5,000 Ideas from Nat Geo. Make sure to check it out. Now, here's a fun thought. What happens when and if a highly corrupt leader took power in one of these cities? After all, human will and the quest for power are extremely powerful forces, leading to a history far too replete with wars and inhumanity towards fellow human beings. Now, the harsh environments found in space will offer immense challenges and near guarantee of multiple heartbreaking disasters, along with our only real hope of ending the reign of tyrannical despots forever. Now, sometime over the next few decades, the first large populations of humans are likely to be making their homes in orbit above the Earth. These early habitats are likely to soar above our planet at a distance roughly equivalent to a one-hour flight aboard a jumbo jet, if you could fly a jet straight up. So, what is to stop a power-hungry, hun petty tyrant, let's call this myth mythical being Ken Ulos, from having complete control over a habitation and you know, running a slave trade or cutting off the air to a trapped population. Our greatest protection from such a scenario lies in one statement popular among rocket scientists. Space is hard. Few nations and no private organizations have the ability to design, build, test, launch, populate, and maintain a human habitation in space, even in low Earth orbit. Because of this, every significant outpost in space is going to need to be a joint effort of multiple nations, educational institutions, and non-governmental organizations. 
So even if Ken decides he's going to shut off all the air to Martian colonists unless, I don't know, they pay some exorbitant rate, this extraterrestrial extortion stands little chance of being carried out. Multiple nations and organizations will control various functions and areas of such spaceborne habitations. The evil plans of Mulos would quickly be snuffed out by partners in these future habitations in space. Not only that one colony, but others in which the partners participate would act as a powerful buffer to any future developer turned bad developer. <laughs> now, each of these habitations we place in the space and populate with human explorers will be intricately connected, depending on each other for their very survival. Incidentally, this same interdependence is also likely to result in freedom from nationalism. Now let's imagine the mindset of a child living on the surface of Mars a hundred years from now. Her great-grandmother first came to the Red Planet. Neither she nor her parents had ever set foot on that distant blue dot in the sky. Squabbles between nations on a far distant blue marble in the night sky will be as far removed from her mind as wars between ancient city-states are to us today. Perceived differences between people based on ancient ideas of nations and race will be cast away as humans move beyond the confines of our planetary cradle. Moving beyond Earth provides our best and perhaps only chance at realizing our full potential as one human race. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to be discussing exoplanets in your backyard. We'll be talking with Allison Johnson, author of Complete National Parks of the United States from National Geographic. We'll get a look at how you can get at least a taste of conditions on distant worlds a lot closer to home. National Park System. So make sure to join us starting Saturday, 3rd of December. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe to our newsletter at thecosmiccompanion.com and never miss an episode. Probably. Also, download, share, like, comment, boost, whatever it is you do on that particular media outlet you're seeing this on. Go ahead, tell a friend about The Cosmic Companion. You'll both be glad you did. Probably. Clear skies. <laughs>